you. Shang Chi, as I'd said, is a movie that I think first ended up on a list of of wouldn't it be great if uh, list uh, wouldn't it be great if we could do this as a movie. Probably twenty years ago, because it's a great story of a uh, of, of a young man that that realizes his father is um, is essentially one of the world's greatest um, supervillains, one of the world's greatest criminals. And, and how do you process that? And how do you deal with that as a, as a child? And how do, you, how do you evolve beyond that? And the heroism needed to, uh, to break free of that and grow beyond that. And even in our film, to, to realize that, uh, that there, there are many sides to all stories and, to, and the, the world's perception of, of his father and his perception of his father um, is more complex than perhaps he initially, he initially thought. That was a great driving story for us that we wanted to, to explore someday. Looking for a filmmaker to, to do it um, uh, was obviously, as it always is important, and Destin Cretton coming in and, again, dedicating his talents. He's an amazing filmmaker who does amazing movies that have been um, uh, on the smaller budgeted size compared to a big Marvel movie, but coming in and giving his personal a vision to this story of this father and son and really this family was very special. And then how we could find somebody to play Shang-Chi was his biggest question when he signed up as uh, as director, our producer, Jonathan Schwartz, and uh, our casting director, Sarah Finn, looked at hundreds of people. And Simu came up relatively late in the process when you just start to get to that point of, maybe it's not gonna happen. Because what you want is everybody in your inner circle, the producers, the filmmakers, to, fight, to see somebody and go, look at each other and go, we found this person. This is the, this is the one. We hadn't, we hadn't had that on Shang-Chi uh, at this point. And Simu came in and Sarah Finn had seen him before and brought him in again. And he did a great, he did a great a reading with Destin. He then did a great chemistry read with, uh, with Aquafina, who was gracious enough to do that. And I will say he, you know, a little bit was, who is this fellow? Let's look him up. That's what you do nowadays. You look up, who is this guy? And he did have a, uh, a um, uh, infectious uh, uh, personality on, online in, uh, in, in the way he interacted with the world and with fandom of, of his show that he was doing in Canada at the time and with a sports team that he was a fan of that was doing well when I happened to, when I happened to, to search him. So he's kind of the, the, the real deal. And, uh, and bringing a new Marvel hero into the fold is never easy and always is a lot of a lot of pressure on us and I'm sure on the actors, but Simu has, uh, has pulled it off in ways that again, I'm very excited for audiences to, uh, to finally uh, see in September. Throughout my life, the 10 rings gave our family power. Well, that's what's fun about the MCU at this stage is we can do something like Shang-Chi, introducing a brand new hero into the MCU and into the, into the world at large but that subtitle and the legend of the Ten Rings actually connects it back to the very beginning of the MCU. The Ten Rings being the organization that uh, kidnapped Tony Stark at the very beginning of Iron Man 1. And that organization was inspired by a character called the Mandarin in the comics. And going back to Iron Man 1, we've been talking about when do we, when do we bring this character to the, to the screen? And only wanted to do it when we felt we could do it supreme uh, justice and really, and really showcase uh, the complexity of this character, which frankly we couldn't do in an Iron Man movie because an Iron Man movie is about Iron Man. An Iron Man movie is about Tony Stark. So Shane Black in his film and his uh, a script that he co-wrote came up with this fun twist that we love to this day and uh, it turned out to be Trevor Slattery. Just because that version wasn't real didn't mean there's not a leader of the Ten Rings organization. And that is who we meet for the first time in uh, in Shang-Chi. And, and Again, talking about actors making, making these characters come to life, Tony Leung playing Shang-Chi's father and the leader of the Ten Rings is another pinch yourself dream come true moment because he's one of the best actors of our time and very excited to, to, to have him introduced to, I hope, a whole new fan base uh, who might not be aware of his spectacular uh, work that he's done. You got this. Thank you. We just recently released the, uh, the final trailer for Shang-Chi, the end of which had a character that looked very, some fans said this looks like a character they hadn't seen in many years, named the Abomination, fighting a character that looks like Wong. 
And I can say um, that the reason it looks like that is because that is Abomination fighting Wong, yes. Um, and again, a fun thing to have a character that, uh, that, uh, that we haven't had on screen in, in a, over a decade um, uh, show up uh, again in the MCU. And to see fans on that little tag of the, of the trailer um, recognize that and embrace that uh, is, uh, is great fun. Throughout the years, we have never interfered until now. Chloe had expressed interest in, in, in Marvel many years ago, even when, when Brad Winderbaum, our producer on uh, Black Widow, was looking for a filmmaker. Her, her, her name came up. She'd done a great film called The Rider. And, and um, uh, she ended up not, not coming in on that film, I don't believe, and, and we we're very lucky to get uh, Kate Shortland to direct uh, that movie at uh, at Scarlett's suggestion. Uh, but when when we were working on Eternals and our producer Nate Moore was was coming up with this uh, pitch to really embrace one of Jack Kirby's greatest creations for Marvel um, amongst all of his great creations. But the Eternals, this this race of immortal beings who've been on Earth for for millennia, is one of his best. And he he asked Chloe to come in and meet. And they really just clicked on this notion of a history of humanity and what it means to be human and the viewpoint of that through these characters, the Eternals. And she came in with a pitch that that got into visuals, which was which was beautiful, but more importantly, into these characters. These are 10 new characters into the into the world, which is a very difficult thing to do. And she embraced that challenge and had a unique viewpoint for for every single one of them. And I'm happy to say that from that initial pitch and meeting to uh, near final version of the film where we are now, um, she has both won a handful of Academy Awards in between and <laughs> delivered on her promise of, uh, of what the Eternals could be. And I look forward to, uh, to people seeing that one as well. I love you, my sons. Remember this place. Home. It was always our hope at Marvel Studios to, to be able to pull off even a little bit uh, in a cinematic form uh, what publishing had been able to do in the comics for, for, uh, for 70 plus years. Um, and, that is, and that is everything from, from the genius of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and, and all of the uh, uh, spectacular artists and, and writers is that they can tell Honestly, stories as big as the Big Bang and the foundation of the universe itself and the foundation of reality and tell something as small and moving as, you know, Peter Parker's origin story or any or that moment in the Loki series when Tom Hiddleston is watching himself in clips from Endgame. It is so heartbreaking. It is so moving. Well, that show also has uh, uh, space lizards and deals with and deals with uh, uh, time itself. It is both that makes Marvel Marvel. It is being able to do the world outside your window on a very personal and emotional level and come at it from a viewpoint that hopefully makes us, makes you think about your place in the grander scheme of reality in the universe. And uh, speaking of Eternals, I think of, I've seen, seen pictures of Jack Kirby at his, at his little drawing desk in his house and thinking the imagination of that man pouring out onto that page. Um, and now, and now uh, the incredible artists led by Chloe uh, doing it in, in, in cinematic form is amazing. It's bringing the human imagination uh, to life uh, on a personal level and a cosmic level that makes uh, uh, Marvel, I think, what it is. There was a time when it looked like Marvel Studios would not be involved in, in Spider-Man movies going forward for Sony. Um, it, it was only a few months, but it was, it was uh, an emotional few months for, I think, all of us on all sides and a very public few months for whatever reason. Um, uh, but yes, I had thought if it were going, I, I, I always want to look at the bright side. And the bright side was we got to make two great uh, Spider-Man movies um, with Amy Pascal and John Watts and Tom Rothman and Tom Holland. Uh, and I was very proud of that and very happy at that. Of course, wanted it to continue, um, but, but always want to be happy with, with what we have instead of upset with what we don't. Luckily, um, uh, 
Tom Rothman and Bob Iger and Alan Horn and Alan Bergman and Tom Holland himself um, all realized, would it just be more fun if we just kept doing it? Let's not let, let's not get business or politics in the way. Because the deal always started with Amy Pascal and I having nothing to do with numbers or contracts or um, politics. It had to do with story and a love of, of Spider-Man and Peter Parker and the Marvel Universe. And it, and it thankfully has continued like that. Uh, and, that's, and that's where we find ourselves now. Michael Morbius. Got tired of doing the whole good guy thing, huh? What's up, Doc? I don't want to obviously talk about rumors or, or speculation on what could happen, what couldn't happen, as it relates to any characters that Marvel Studios hasn't, hasn't brought to the screen yet. But I will say what I've always said, which is having been in Marvel for 20 years, I wouldn't dismiss anything. Or I wouldn't rule anything out. When and how and where remains to be seen. It could, it could be, you know, any rumor that you read online could happen uh, anytime between tomorrow and never. Get down here and fight! The mirror image. You can't affect the real world in here. Who's laughing now? You know, I spoke earlier about everything we do at Marvel Studios is from the point of view of, of the audience. And how do we make the audience feel one way? Or how do we evoke an emotion out of an audience? I really feel like I learned that from watching Sam on the Spider-Man movies, where I was just very lucky to be there working for the former head of, of Marvel Studios, Avi Rod, and just watching, watching Avi, watching uh, Laura Ziskin, the producer of that, watching Amy Pascal, who ran the studio at the time, and particularly Sam Raimi put that those movies together. So now being in a position that that Sam is back in the Marvel Universe and, and working for us on Doctor Strange, which aside from Spider-Man, both Steve Ditko co-creations, um, what was his favorite characters, is is really quite quite remarkable and full circle for me personally from uh, my my journey at, at, at Marvel. And But really it's just exciting to get to watch Sam work again and to see Sam Raimi put his Sam Raimi stamp on Doctor Strange, on the multiverse, on Marvel. And for people who know what that stamp is, um, they can be very excited. And for people who don't yet know what that stamp is, I can't wait for them to see this movie, be blown away by it and go, what else has he done? And delve into Sam Raimi's uh, a filmography, which is, uh, which is uh, one of the best of all time. Hey yo, this yours? Who are you? Yes, I mean, the death of Chad hit, hit all of us um, extremely hard. And at the same time as it hit the world, because we didn't, we didn't know either. Um, uh, and there were all sorts of, of questions. And, and our first thought for many weeks afterwards had nothing to do with the movie. It had to do with, with him and his, and his family and his wife and his legacy. Um, and, and really we were looking uh, to Ryan Coogler for guidance. As, as one, frankly, always should about almost everything in life. I'd recommend following Ryan Coogler for guidance. Um, and, and having the discussions, which is essentially came down to continuing um, the legacy of Wakanda and continuing um, with, with that storyline in a very um, meaningful, respectful, and yet still hopeful and fun and exciting way, um, which, is, which, was, which was difficult. Um, uh, after, after, after uh, losing Chad. And I will say that, that Ryan and our producer, Nate Moore, and the entire cast and our co-writer, Joe Robert Cole, um, have done some remarkable things in the story and the draft. And, and the, the, the team is assembling once again and, and, and cameras roll uh, in the not too distant future on that. And it will be extremely emotional across the board, but I think they have something um, uh, very special in mind. something to fight for it. We're the ones who changed everything. You know, the, the definition of phases often evolve with the phase and, and often I leave up to writers and journalists to decide. That's for, the, that's for the film historians to tell us what the phases were about. Truthfully, it is, phase four was always about continuing in new ways and new beginnings. Um, uh, even, even uh, you know, with, with 
uh, films that uh, that seemingly are concluding storylines, there are there are new beginnings within them, and that's what was most exciting to us about the opportunity to to make shows for Disney Plus about all of us at Marvel Studios choosing to continue um, past Endgame and past Far From Home once and leaving the Infinity Saga behind to a new a new beginning. And uh, that that I think is what uh, is what people will be looking at uh, at phase four. Uh, hope I hope is having accomplished. Uh, but we're in the middle of it now, so remains to be seen. We don't take our foot off the gas. We don't take anything for granted, and we all work extremely hard to uh, to deliver. <laughs>